Hello everybody, and boom. Let's talk of some ghost stories. Clearly, we're doing Susan Hill's The Woman in Black, which is a pretty famous recent ghost novel, but first I'd like to talk about the literary history of ghost stories. If you're really interested in this kind of thing, I'd recommend you check out the following book, the Oxford Book of English Ghost Stories, which gives a fantastic sampling of the genre over the last two centuries. For now though, Let's just discuss what makes The Woman in Black such a fun read for any aficionado of the ghost tale. So, ghosts, or at least the idea of ghosts, they've been around, as I'm sure you guys realize, for a really long time. They're pretty common in many cultures all over the world, and in Western lit, there are even ghosts that appear in ancient Roman writers like Ap Apuleius and Petronius. But as an actual literary genre, you might be surprised and ghost stories, they're relatively recent, and most of them are thanks to English writers. In the 18th century, granted, there were Gothic novels like Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto that had ghosts, but those ghosts were usually minor factors in the plot. Ghost stories proper, however, only really got going in the 1820s, so the genre is only about 200 years old, and the English ends up being really good at it. Perhaps the key factor to any ghost story, though, is that it has to be about a ghost. The spook, the specter, the phantasm, it must do something deliberately and intentionally, or it must impact the living in some way. That's a ghost story. The question though, given how ancient the concept of ghosts is, is why it took the genre so long to develop. Well, like anything else, there's probably a couple of reasons. One reason is the rise of mass literacy and short fiction magazines in Great Britain during the 19th century. That created a whole new market for popular fiction, and ghost stories certainly fall into that category. Another reason, however, you could argue, is that the genre needed a fundamental shift in how modern people and cultures understood the relationship between the natural and the supernatural. Here, I'm thinking specifically of something that might be called post-enlightenment consensus reality. The name's a mouthful, but the idea is pretty straightforward. First, think about modern science. As a social process geared towards testing hypotheses and conducting empirical experiments, modern science got its start in the 16th century. But it was only during the 18th century, specifically the European Enlightenment, that cultural attitudes toward the physical world began to rapidly shift in favor of scientific thinking. In other words, it was only during the Enlightenment that the way we thought about the difference between what exists and what does not exist as something that depended fundamentally on what science could or could not prove. So, thanks to the scientific point of view, things like ghosts began to be considered pure superstition. Now, this doesn't mean that individual people or groups of people didn't continue to believe in the supernatural, but it does mean that such beliefs became ever more marginalized in Western culture. Now, obviously, that sucks if you happen to be a professional ghost hunter or a serious student of paranormal activity. But it ended up being really awesome for the ghost story genre, because the way these stories get their impact, it's through the sudden apparition of something that, according to science, is not supposed to exist. Ghosts get their power to terrify through getting readers to believe in a sudden and often fatal violation of everyday reality by the supernatural. Sometimes there's a direct manifestation of the ghost, but more often, more subtly, there is merely the suggestion of a ghost. The suggestion that there exists something on the outer edges of our perception that is non-normal. That is usually enough for a good ghost story. And in classic tales about ghosts, there are no Casper the Friendly Ghost characters. For M.R. James, for example, who is the best ghost story writer of the Victorian era, Victoria era, Victorian era. Uh, the chief specter in a ghost story must always be malevolent or odious. Ghost stories usually operate through the unwanted intrusion of the supernatural on our normal, everyday reality. That makes ghosts the ultimate other, and they gather the power because our modern sense of reality today is so completely governed by the scientific perspective. The importance of post-Enlightenment consensus reality, by the way, 
It explains why supernatural fiction so often relies on the trope of the rational character. In non-supernatural fiction, the rational character trope can link to people like Sherlock Holmes, who's a staple of detective fiction in the style of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. In supernatural fiction, however, the rational character is going to be that person who accepts wholeheartedly the dominance of the scientific perspective. And then, boom, ghost appears. And that's supposed to be terrifying, because if the rational character believes in the supernatural, you should believe in it too. But what do you start looking for? This rational character trope appears everywhere in supernatural fiction. In The Woman in Black, for instance, Arthur Kipps is a classic case. Likewise, if you have ever, ever read Bram Stoker's Dracula, Jonathan Harker is another classic example. And actually, Oscar Wilde uses the rational character trope to good effect in The Canterville Ghost. But since his story is essentially comedic, his Americans are maybe a bit too rational for Sir Simon de Canterville. But anyway, back to literary history. The heyday of ghost stories is the Victorian era, roughly the latter half of the 19th century in England. And it was named that because, with that famous, famous British cleverness, that was the reign of Queen Victoria. But all this is important to know because The Woman in Black, the whole novel, is basically a shout out to classic Victorian ghost stories. For the Victorians, they set many of the classic tropes of the genre. Uh, haunted mansions, clanking chains, uh, isolated and remote locales, locked rooms, horrible secrets, stuff like that. And in chapter one of The Woman in Black, page 14, the Christmas ghost stories that are being told by author's kids, they use many of those tropes. As Hill writes, their stories had dripping stone walls and uninhabited castles of and of ivory-clad monastery ruins by moonlight, of locked inner rooms and secret dungeons, dank charnel houses and overgrown graveyards. He goes on like that. In fact, uh, there are features in The Woman in Black. There are features in The Woman in Black rather prominently a locked in a room and an overgrown family cemetery. So Hill knows what she's doing here. But just in case her readers still miss the point, when Arthur's boss first gives him his assignment to sort out Alice Straeblau's estate, on page 26 he thinks, the business was beginning to sound like something from a Victorian novel, with a reclusive old woman having hidden a lot of ancient documents somewhere in the depths of her cluttered house. But there's also a ton of other sly references to Victorian ghost stories, too. For example, look at the title of chapter 10, called Whistle and I'll Come to You. As you might imagine, this chapter features a ghost whistling with ill intent. Whistles are very evil, everybody knows that. But what you might not realize is that Hill is kind of doing a wink and nudge thing here. He's referring directly to M.R. James, whom I mentioned a little bit earlier as a classic writer of Victorian ghost tales. His best known story is called A Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad. And Hill definitely wants you keeping that association in mind as you read your chapter. There's also, if you're interested, a classic 1968 short film of James. James's story available on YouTube. I'll link to that in the comments. But there's one last piece of ghost story literary history that I want to leave you guys with as you read The Woman in Black. On page 18, there's this little inset poem. It's not Victorian, but it does come from William Shakespeare, specifically Act 1, Scene 1 of Hamlet. If you're familiar with the play, you know that the ghost of Hamlet's murdered father appears before his son, and he demands that Hamlet get revenge on his murderer, his wife's slaughter lover, Claudius. Now, this idea of revenge, you already know it pretty well from studying Beowulf. And keep in mind that Hamlet is the prince of Denmark, so he's literally a descendant of King Hrothgar and the Danes from the poem. And so the principle of revenge is still very much a part of Hamlet's cultural heritage. And the play itself focuses on his inability to actually follow through on the command of his father to get revenge for his death. But if you'll notice, the woman in black is not interested in the topic of revenge. In fact, it's very explicitly a Christian ghost story. It has a traditional Christian loathing of revenge as a solution to problem. And you could argue that the real meaning of Jeanette Humphrey the real point of the novel's ghost 
is to teach Arthur Kipps true meaning of grief, of pity for suffering, which are arguably the two emotions most important to the Christian worldview. Well, anyway, Hill doesn't care about Shakespeare's revenge motif. Instead, this is the passage from Hamlet that she cites. Some say that ever against that season comes, wherein our Savior's birth is celebrated. This bird of dawning singeth all night long. And then, they say, no spirit dare stir abroad. The nights are wholesome. Then no planets strike. No fairy takes her which hath power to charm. And hallowed and so gracious is that time in Christmas. So, if ghosts are parts of the powers of darkness, then those powers have no strength during Christmas time. The time when the Holy Ghost, you might say, is ascendant. In the immediate context of the woman in black, Arthur is using his this time of year to exorcise the horrors of the tragedies his encounter of Jeanette's ghost had caused. He's going to heal himself by telling the story. After a lifetime already spent learning what grief and pity for suffering truly mean. Susan Hill does all this deliberately. And it's all these resonances with the literary history of ghost stories that gives the woman in black its especially chilling touch. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you.